Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me in another of my wonderful interviews. As you know, the police are not always what they seem. In my day, when I was growing up, I used to watch Dixon of Doc Green. I've mentioned this before, evening all. And the police seem to be very friendly and helpful. But what's happened? They've changed. It does seem to me that they have become rather corrupt. Now, a gentleman who's joining me today has had the full force of the law thrown at him, uh, police corruption, but he won, won his case. And we're going to find out about that and uh, other things as well, I'm sure. So I'm very thrilled to bring uh, to our show today a freelance photographer, Jonathan Dow, or John for short. Hello, John. Hello, Richard. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be on the show. A absolutely a, a pleasure. And it's interesting... This seems to be very much a popular uh, strand uh, because people are finding that our police service is not what it once was and they do seem to be more of um, a cash organisation extracting oh, yeah. money and helping enforcement officers, as I found to my peril, uh, oh, yeah. rather than, than helping you know everyday people. Oh, so it's going to be interesting to find out um, a little about that. But before we do that, you were just telling me beforehand, as a freelance photographer, you do a lot of weddings, and you were just telling me a little bit about the um, the pandemic uh, era of lockdown. Could you just tell us a little bit about how that worked? Because, again, that sort of authority overstretching their mark again. Yeah, well, I mean, there were 16 months of direct disruption from the beginning of the pandemic up till about the middle of July 21. Um, and for me, I ended up moving two entire years worth of wedding bookings for photo and video. And then when the restrictions finally ended, I had a deluge of over 350 weddings to photograph and film all at once. And to, for me, it caused a, a big backlog in editing and keeping up with the work and causing oh, can... repetitive strain injury from sitting at the computer all the time, crazy typing away and, and video editing. And uh, I'm, I'm still sort of catching up now because it was a perpetual backlog on top of all the other full, um, you know, original bookings that were there in the calendar so, already. So during the, the lockdown, as I remember it, you know, weddings were reduced right down to a very minimum amount mm. of people having very tiny weddings. And, yeah. and were they allowing people like photographers and, you know, those sort of people in? Yeah, well, to begin with, there was a big question mark over whether does the photographer count as one of the people numbers who were allowed to be in the room in one go? Because yeah. I think that the, the worst it got, it was six guests maximum plus the registrar. So that was eight people in the room and then no one else was allowed. And then not long after that, through, I don't know who argued the toss about it, but the photographers and videographers, we became extra to the guest and bride and groom quotas so we didn't influence whether a bride or groom would drop us off and then have a grandparent there, for example. Um, yeah. But yes, I, I mean, I did photograph and film a, a small number of weddings through sort of like, I don't know, summer, autumn 2020 and the early bit of 21. And I mean, they were so depressing. There was like some had five, six people there. Other people had, I think, about 20 guests. Everybody had to sit far apart, face masks on. Oh, was, I was going uh, to say, are the, yeah. are the wedding photos full of face masks? Yeah, and the videos as well. You know, I mean, all you can see is this bit of fabric. And I mean, how am I supposed to lip sync things if I need to do any lip sync? <laughs> <laughs> now, being in a video business, I know exactly that sort of yeah. problem. But, you know, people looking back at those wedding photos, that special day, they've spent, uh, you know, a long time. It's such an important day. Yeah. And... I mean, it, it must have been soul destroying, not only for them, of course, but for yeah. you putting out and saying, well, here's your video and everyone's all sort of in comedy masks. Yeah. Well, the other thing was, was they couldn't have after after parties. They couldn't have loud music. They couldn't do the dancing because there was this assumption that shouting over loud music was expelling spit everywhere and that that was yes. going to share whatever this thing was supposed to be that obviously we know a bit better about it now absolutely um so it was literally somebody would pay tens of thousands of pounds for a huge venue they'd have 15 or 20 guests there 
and it would basically result in the same thing as if they went to the local registry office said a few words got some rings had a kiss and then went home and we did a few pictures in the gardens and a bit of walkabout video and whatnot and then everybody went yeah. and they were you know so i mean venues as well they they couldn't make any profit because they had to have minimum guest numbers and they couldn't afford the catering companies and you know there were so many sanctions on different types of suppliers that suppliers were pulling out of it all because it wasn't financially viable for them and all of that added up to people having teensy little weddings as well and, and grandparents and... they couldn't go because they were being frightened to stay indoors as all this yes, vulnerability stuff and we'd got some uh, couples were trying to do live streaming with poor quality signals at churches out in the back of beyond just so that nan and granddad could watch it and it was all collapsing and of course it was put at the front next to me even though it wasn't my equipment and i said yeah i'll keep my eye on it for you and it was just signal dropouts all the time so people ended up not even seeing it you know i mean obviously i was there photographing and filming it so they could watch it later but it you know it's the same thing no of course and and i know this isn't the main subject that we're going to talk about but yes. i do think it's important to just continually remind people of the the overreach of yes. um, authority and how it had disrupted people so that should anything like this come up again we are reminded of of just how awful it really was for something yes. which perhaps wasn't as nasty as we were led to believe oh yeah and, yeah but anyway, so let's uh, let's move on to the, the main thing, uh, which is about police corruption. So uh, you have a, a fascinating story. Um, yes. And the good news is that you, you won the case. And I think that's obviously is, it gives people hope. And, and I do want to give people hope on this channel. So maybe you could yeah. just tell us what happened. Yeah, well, so I'm going to do it all from memory. And it was in 2014. Right. So we're talking a decade ago. So Yeah, 2014. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Just goes so, to show how long this, this has been going on. Yeah. Well, actually, as a side note, before I get onto that, there was a thing about police corruption and how things have gone. Now, back in the year 2000, I worked for an electrical company, a high street retailer, and the one of the managers there was doing night school over at Stafford Police Training Campus. And he wanted me to go and pick him up one night at sort of about nine ten o'clock at night so i turned up there the gatehouse for this campus had no idea that there was one class actually running which i thought was a bit weird because they're the police and they're supposed to know yeah but they let me through and then i ended up having to go into this big building it's like a college building and i was walking about trying to find where they were and i happened upon yeah happened upon a pile <laughs> of recruitment paperwork which were you know when you get these questionnaires that you fill in and it says choose answers A to E and mm. put a cross in the box and there's no wrong answers. Right. And they're the sort of documents that a human doesn't sit there ticking them off like your school teacher. They put them through a machine and the scanner picks up what you crossed and yes. then that will pin punch out a score. Well, that's what they'd got there. And I started looking at them while I was kind of hanging around waiting and I thought, right, well, these look a bit familiar to me. They turned out in the end to be psychometric test questionnaires that are the same sort of thing that a psychiatrist uses, what they call patient health questionnaires, PHQs. And they were basically, when I looked at them a bit further, and I wish I, I wish I'd brought a copy back with me, but I was just stood there looking at it thinking, because I'd, I'd been and had some psychiatry and counselling things, because I had some had happened to me in my teens, and, and you know, it's just nothing serious or anything like that. But, um, I, I was familiar with these um, yes. psychometric questionnaires. And the more I looked at it and the more it was sort of steering you to these certain answers, it dawned on me that they were looking for the, um, the successful candidate to be a police recruit, to be somebody that had a low level of empathy, but a high level of sociopathy and narcissism. Right. And that was so that seems to me how things have gone over the last couple of decades, at least. And I don't know how far before it was happening, because obviously that was that one time that I got to see those things. But it goes to show, you know, it's all the just doing our job type of stuff. And the fact Absolutely. that they come and help uh, bailiffs with civil matters that they shouldn't get into, you know, even involved in. Yeah, no, that yeah. is that is very interesting. And, and that's not the first time I've heard that. Yeah. Um, that 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 you know that they are looking for people not only who will do do as they're told, yeah. Um, and it is that whole thing about I'm only doing orders, which means yeah. you're just taking somebody else's 
um, opinion or thought process and you're just dis- you're not having any moral thoughts about yes. actually what am I doing? No, is I that don't. a good thing? And you know we see we see that in big massive conflicts. But if it's in the police who are there supposedly to help us, then it's a big yeah. worry. So well, com- yes, compare them to firemen, for example. Just think right. if, a, if a fireman did the same questionnaire, they'd be found out to be much more empathetic, which is why you tend to find that fire people, you know, like you see these auditors on YouTube, they go around and stand outside filming a police station with a gimbal. Yes. Well, when they go to a fire station, it's most of the time it's, oh, hi, do you want to come and have a look around? Would you like a cup of tea, sir? Do you want to come and sit in the fire engine? Yeah. Totally different um, calibre Isn't of that, people. That is, that is so, because you can imagine at a fire, if they're going, well, I'm not going in there. Yeah, you know, but there's my screaming baby. <laughs> yeah. You know, on the top floor. Why, why won't you say? No, nah, no, nah, not going in there, mate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, here's here's a bucket, and there's some water down there. You put it out. <laughs> you know, it's it's, it's it is a bit like that with the police, isn't it? It's like, well, we're not going to come if uh, if there's any sort of threat to us. But if, of course, it's just a civil matter, uh, we'll come definitely and uh, we'll assist the bailiff, which yeah, is what yeah. seems to be going on. So tell us about what happened to you. Right, so um, March 2014, um, I got a letter from West Midlands Police and it had come from Snow Hill Station in Birmingham. And what they'd said was they'd caught me speeding on the M42 motorway somewhere up by where the Birmingham airport is, that I was doing 51 miles an hour while the smart motorway gantries said 40. And I thought to myself, well, that won't be right because I'll obviously nobody's going to speed through a speed trap and then end up with all this sort of commotion. So in this paperwork, it was literally just one letter that was asking me to say whether I was the driver or not, or if I wasn't, who was it? Mm. And they hadn't even put any photographs in there of the speed trap stuff, which I thought they would, you know, because we've all been, well, some of us might have been caught by a gatso in the past and they send you a lovely portrait of the back of your car, which is nice. Yes. So there was no evidence. No, there was nothing. So I got on the phone straight away and I called um, West Midlands Police Switchboard and I said, could you put me through to Snow Hill? So they put me through. And the first person I spoke to was a lady on their reception. And I said to her, "This is, is this actually a real thing? And I gave her the references and she looked it up and she says, yes, it's a real speeding ticket. So I asked her, can I get the evidence then? Because I don't agree with it. And I need to get both the speed trap photographs of my car going over the dots, which they'll use to make the measurements. But also, I want the video camera footage from the video cameras that are further back up the road that film the back of your car. And they'll have the gantry in show with all the 40s or 50s or whatever it said on there. Right. Because, I mean, these days, you know, you'll have those yellow Haydex 3s, I think they call them, Haydex um, speed track cameras on the motorway. And they'll they're be the, hidden on the gantries. Yeah, yeah, the yellow boxes. Well, about 100 yards back up the road before you get to the gantry, there's usually a post that's got three video cameras on it, for one for each lane. And what that's supposed to do is it's supposed to gather the evidence that the car being alleged to have gone through a restricted speed it shows the the gantry and they've got everything they need so going back to the police phone call um the lady put me through to one department firstly so i could ask them to get me the speed trap camera shots and then they said yeah okay well we'll get those arranged to send out to you and i said can i get the video camera stills showing the gantry at the same time as the car Oh, they said, we'll have to put you back through to reception because you'll need to go through to such and such a department because they're different. So I went back through and I said, right, I've had that bit. Could you please put me through to get the uh, video camera shots? Oh, yes, okay. So they patched me through to another office. And I asked them, and whoever it was at the police station, took on the responsibility and owned it in saying that they would get me these video stills. So I thought I said, thank you very much, put the phone down, and that was it. And then yeah. about sort of eight or nine days later, I get a letter from them in the post. And in there, it said, please find enclosed the speed camera track stills. And there was the, the first click and the second click showing me traveling across the road markings that they calculate the speed with. And it said that um, I was doing 51 miles an hour and that the dots on the road were two meters apart which I'll come back to in a bit because there's something quite important about that as well. And then it also said, (laughs) I'll tell you what, this is a good one, this is. 
Um, it also said, by the way, if I want to get the video camera stills showing the gantry with the actual speed limit signs lit up, that I'd need to call the highways agency and ask them for it because they deal with those video cameras and it's not the police. Right. So I thought, right, fair enough. So I phoned the highways agency and got through, gave them all the dates, times, references and whatnot. And uh, I said, I asked them, I said, can I get this video footage because I need it as evidence? Oh, I'm ever so sorry, they said. We only keep the video footage for seven days on a rolling hard drive system and then it gets scrubbed over unless somebody asks for it. Oh, right. So I said, well, this is the date and time that I called Snow Hill and they said that they would call you and or get in touch, however, and ask for this footage to be retained as evidence. No, nobody's phoned us, nobody's called us for it, so unfortunately it's gone. Right. right fair, so fair enough, I said, and put the phone down, you know, thanks very much, Highways Agency. So the first thing that had happened was the West Midlands Police had, they, they know how the Highways Agency work, they'll have a close working relationship with them, they'll know how long this video footage lasts for before it gets erased because it's rolling hard drives like CCTV. And they waited until after it had been erased to write to me to tell me that it would be me that had to get it if I wanted it so that they knew that it would be too late and it would be gone. Yes. So I marked that off as count number one of the police deliberately withheld, withholding and destroying critical evidence in the matter. Yes. But I hadn't got evidence to prove that they had taken on the responsibility of getting it yet. So... That was something that I'll do a bit later on. So then going back to the photos that I did have from the speed trap, I looked at it, and at the time I'd got um, a Saab 95 estate, and it was about four and a half metres long. And I counted the dots that were covering, uh, that the car was covering on the road. And it worked out that if they were two metres apart, my car was supposed to be some 10 metres long. Right. And I thought, well, that's going to be wrong as well. Yeah. So I thought, well, they're calculating 51 miles an hour based off these road markings. So um, somebody went and measured the road markings one night at probably three o'clock in the morning um, at that particular spot on the motorway. I, th I think they happened to break down momentarily with a yes, tape. Yes, it can measure. easily happen to anybody. Yeah. You break yeah. down I mean, I, and, you know, you're walking I, I, in the road looking for help. Can't I, help but I, measure the space, you know. Yeah. So I couldn't possibly imagine who did that, but it was a great favour for them, you know. So I, yeah. I, bought, I bought them a cup of tea for their trouble. Um, and they didn't even turn out to be what they were supposed to be, was one metre apart. They were actually 98 centimetres apart. So when it came to the police effectively splitting hairs on whether the threshold is to prosecute somebody or not, those mm. two centimetres were just on the cusp. So the road markings weren't even correct either. So that Gosh, was number... and that and that could be you know many of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It could be all of them for all we know. Because I mean, yeah. who goes out and you know? It... Fortunately for me, I had somebody that was kind enough to go and measure them at that time in the morning when the motorway yes. was quiet. Gosh. And, but uh... that is it. That I mean, that in and of itself is a fascinating point, isn't it? Because yeah. we it takes so much as oh, the the measurements are correct, and you go, well, yeah. hold on a second, are well, every... they? Yeah, well, because everybody focuses on trying to get, um, you know, people will write off and say, I want the certificates to say when the cameras were last calibrated. And that's the, yes. the usual argument that people tend to take. And a lot of solicitors take that argument as well. You know, they always try to go for the, the speed camera wasn't good enough type of route, you know. Yes. So that was count number two, was that they'd falsified the road markings to calculate the speed by saying that they were two metres apart. And by their own calculations, that must have meant that because they were just under one metre apart, that I must have only been travelling at 25 and a half miles an hour instead of 51. Gosh, and they yeah, were, right. And the whole commotion was because they were saying that the speed camera said 40 at the time, and I was denying it and saying that they must have said 50, because what's one mile an hour? We've got leeway. Um, so I'd got them on the um, deliberately destroying the evidence, but I hadn't got the hard evidence yet, which I'll come to in a second. Right. And I'd also got them on the falsifying the uh, documents for the speed camera info. So that first document that I sent 
back to them. I actually wrote additional notes on it. It was the, the, the document that they wanted you to say whether you were the driver or not, so that they could then proceed with sending you the next bit, which would have been the camera shots and hmm. the prosecutions and how do you plead and all that sort of stuff. And um, where did we get to? Let me just get my brain back in gear. There's that much to remember because it was a decade ago. Well, yes, of course. So let's have a think. We, we've done the... It was the road markings. We've done that one. So then it was yeah. going to be... God, my brain's frazzled. You might need to cut a little bit out while I'm doing my thinking <laughs> time. <laughs> so, yeah, no, you... So, you, yeah, so you had your first letter. Were you the driver? Well, that was You've the... Got, yeah, it was the extra yeah. info I wrote on that paperwork. So right. I've written a load of additional stuff about how I didn't agree with it and why, blah de blah I sent that back to Snow Hill Police Station. That and Before I did that, I started building a court bundle. So everything that I was filling in and sending out or typing up and posting out... I was scanning copies of stuff so that I'd got my copy. So I'd wrote ex all this extra info on the paperwork and scanned and stored a copy on the computer for my court bundle further down the road because I was prepared to fight it. Mm. Sent that back to the police station. And what Snow Hill Station did was they completely erased all my extra notes, stamped approved over the top of it, and then sent it off to what turned out to be Wolverhampton Magistrates Court where they've got an office that deals with the administration of setting up court dates and whatnot for road traffic offences. So I find that out later on that they've scribbled the documents out because further down the line when I was asking them for copies of stuff, they sent me a copy back and it, all the documents and you could had all see been, it been redacted, right? Yeah, so for my court bundle, I'd got my copy with everything written on versus their copy with everything scribbled out and approved stamped on it. So that was them tampering with documents, which was count number three. So they tampered with documents, they'd falsified road marking um, dots, and the crucial bit was that they'd allowed the highways agency to destroy the highways agency video footage. Yes. So I still needed that key piece of evidence that would prove that the police station said that they would get the footage from the video camera back up the road. So I did a little bit of searching, and I can't quite remember how I came about it, but I ended up finding out that at Loughborough Magistrates Court, they've got a, a call centre type department that deals with the logging and um, what's it called? It's not telemetry. What's it? Transcripts. The transcripts of all the police, police station phone calls coming in and out. So I phoned them up. And I mean, how are people supposed to know this sort of stuff? Well, think, exactly. You know, I just, I, I can't even remember how I found it out. I just ended up Googling about it and like, right, who does the call logs for the police stations? Yeah. So I got the number, I phoned Loughborough Magistrates Court and I spoke to this girl called Naomi. I mean, I can even remember her last name, but I won't say it because obviously no. you don't want to expose She's probably moved on by now. Yeah. <laughs> um, hopefully she's come to her senses and, and got herself a better job. Yes. Uh, ooh, wow. Um... <laughs> <laughs> so I said to her, right, this is the date, the time, this is my phone number. Can you have a look at what calls and information you've got for me calling Snow Hill back on such a date? So she looked on the computer and she said, right, we can see that you called up the switchboard. They gave you the number or put you through to Snow Hill. Snow Hill put you through to one office to get footage from the, the, the speed trap. And then you got put back through to reception, who put you through to a different office to ask for the footage from the video camera. And I says, have you got anything else about it? They says, yes, both departments agreed that they would get wow. um, the, the footage. The information, yeah. yeah. So I said to her, well, that's brilliant, thanks. I'm, I'm actually recording this phone call at the, the same time, so you don't mind me using this as, as proof to enter into the, uh, the court bundle. She says, no, absolutely, go ahead. Thank you very much. Put the phone down. So I then got that key piece of evidence so I could prove that they'd allowed that footage to be destroyed. Because if I'd have got it, it would have said 50. And then yeah. 51 miles an hour was neither here nor there. And it would have been a non-starter. Mm. So I, not far down the line there. In fact, from March um, 2014 up till the 9th of October, which was the date of the hearing at uh, Birmingham Magistrates Court, I decided straight away that I was going to take copies of everything and create three copies so that there was a, a bundle for me, a bundle for the courts, and a bundle for Snow Hill Police. 
And instead of posting stuff up, because I thought, well, they're going to lose things or deny Oh, things. yes, it always gets lost in the post. Oh, yeah, because they'd already buggered about with paperwork that I'd sent them, and they'd already falsified stuff, and they'd already allowed other evidence to be destroyed. So I spent that six months going backwards and forwards from my house near Tamworth to uh, Birmingham Magistrates Court with each document and things that I wanted entering in. Took three copies with me put them through the reception, they stamped them all and signed them and dated them. They kept a copy, I had two back, and I started sending one off to the police station, so we all had a, a, a bundle. They never bothered creating a bundle because it doesn't look as though they bother at all for, for these sorts of things. Right. So, then, uh, oh, and also, because I'd been backwards and forwards to the court that many times, I ended up on pretty much first name terms with the two chaps that were running the X-ray machine and the baggage and scan. <laughs> are you here again, John? I says, yeah, I am. They're, oh, God, they're persistent buggers, aren't they? I says, yeah, they are. And I put my bag through one day. This was about, I don't know, the 10th or 11th time I'd been. And when I went to pick my bag up off the X-ray co uh, conveyor belt, I looked at the contents of my bag on the screen that they'd got. And on there was the shape of a traditional Stanley knife in my bag. And I looked at it and I, looked, I said, why is there a, a, why is there a, I haven't got a Stanley blade in my bag. What's that all about? And they said, oh, it doesn't matter. Between you and me, the X-ray machines put random prohibited object clip arts on there. You're joking. No. And I wished I'd, at the time, because they'd still got my camera as part of the stuff going through and it had gone by. Right. I thought, well, if I could, could have got a photograph of it, that is, phone. yeah. That I mean, that, that is yeah. jaw dropping. So they put Stanley blades, um, other types of flick knife, aerosols, and deodorant things. Because of course you're not allowed to take those in as well. Um, and I don't know what else they might put. A gun and this was this was where at the court. This was Birmingham Magistrates Court entrance, where you get scanned. Your bags go through the X-ray machine, and then you go yes. through the scanner, and then they wave the magic wand around you and see whether you've got anything in your pockets. And, it randomly... and they admitted it to you? Yeah. Well, it's probably because I'd spotted it and gone, yeah. what's it all about? And then because I'd been there that many times and they knew right. me, they, they must have felt comfortable telling me. That is, I, I'm, I yeah. am absolutely amazed. So that was just a, an extra bit of sort of side note, which I thought was really interesting. So then we go to um, the 9th of October, which was the court date. Now... On the run-up to part of it, I'd ended up sort of getting brought into sort of part of the free man on the land sort of movement. So part of what I'd been entering in had got the the gubbins about it that was, I don't consent, this is the wrong jurisdiction, blah de blah So when I got there at 10am, uh, there was a group of people sitting outside waiting because it was, it was speed trap day, you know. Right. Yeah, um, And everybody else was going in and having their bit for 10, 15 minutes and coming out and going, and they were forgetting about me. And a few hours had passed, so I, I asked the usher, I said, could you go in there and find out why they're, they're forgetting about me? Because loads of people have come after me, and they've gone in and they've come and gone. And it was just basically pretty much me and a couple of other people still there in the afternoon. Yeah, okay, she said. She went in, and a couple of minutes later, she came back out, and she said... Apparently, the magistrates aren't prepared to let you come into the room because you're going to play free man games. <laughs> and I said to her, right, well, what's going to happen then? Is they're going to end up finding me guilty in my absence, aren't they? And she said, probably. Yeah. So I said to her, right, go in there and tell them that Mr. Dow is ready for his meeting. <laughs> so I thought I'd give them the joinder that they were so desperate to get. Yes. She went in, and then a minute or so later, she said, OK, then, Mr. Dow, follow me, then we'll... Uh, and I went in. She sat on a, um, a chair by the inside of the door. And this courtroom, I was expecting it to be all the old-fashioned wooden, different right, levels yeah. and all that sort of stuff. But what it actually was was just a big oblong office. And as I went in, down the left-hand side, there was two people from West Midlands Police, plus their prosecutor, on the wall facing as I went in, there was three old ladies that were sitting there who it turned out to be the magistrates. No names, wouldn't give their names, basically sat there like three turkeys, gobble, 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 <laughs> and po <-fing. laughs> So they completely remained anonymous, which we know is um, unlawful of them to do. 
Right. And then on and then on the third wall there was the clerk or clerk, whichever it is. So you yeah, the clerk conference. of the court, is it? Yeah. Either way. And then at the stenographer. Yes. Doing the shorthand on a little computer thing. So there was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plus the usher. There was nine people in there versus just me. And as I walked in, they'd all got desks around the outside of the room facing into the middle. And in the centre of the room was one school chair from the 70s, like a wooden school chair. My God. (laughs) It had got no, there was no desk or table or anything. And I just immediately knew they're going to wait for me to sit down so that they can get some joinder by demanding you to stand up. Because they were all sitting down all the time, nobody else stood. So I went in, and I was—I tell you what—I just—I was so chipper. I thought, well, I've got them here. <laughs> I went in chipper as f. <laughs> morning. I went in morning. Took my coat off, put it on the back of the chair, put my bag on the bum part of the chair, so that obviously right. it was obvious I wasn't going to sit down. And I thought, right, well, I'm going to play my game now. And I said to them, right before we begin. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I says, before before we begin, can I just check that you've got your court bundle pointing to the police people and the court's court bundle from downstairs, which is all signed, sealed, dated and stamped in in the records. And they all looked at each other, all po-faced. Nobody bothered to even get it. I says, right, well, I'm quite prepared to stand here and wait while somebody goes downstairs and fetches it and they couldn't be bothered. So I says, right, well, fair enough then. We'll have to go off my court bundle then, won't we? And uh, I'd got the, the, the document, the paperwork I'd set up, all numbered pages. So I did it all properly because they don't like it if it ain't. Um, and a CD-ROM with all the recorded audio calls of all the different bits of evidence that I'd gathered. So I says, right, well, I'm going to start then. Um, <laughs> before we begin with your allegations against me, I've got full evidence of three counts of corruption by West Midlands Police, more in particular, the Snow Hill Police Station. And they all started looking a bit nervous and gawping at each other. I says, right, well, the first thing is, is," and I went into it all, I says, we've got the original document you sent me, I wrote extra information on, here's my copy with all the information that I took the liberty of scanning before I posted to you. Here's the one that you've sent to me with everything redacted and then you've stamped approved on it before you've sent it off to Wolverhampton. I said, so that is tampering with documentation. That's corruption. Put that down on the table. I said, I've got uh, count number two. Their calculations based on my speed are from these speed trap photographs here. And they say that those dots on the road are two metres apart. And I've had them measured. And they all looked at each other thinking, oh, God, when's he had them measured? How how are we going to find that out? Well, they're not going to find it out because they couldn't be bothered to get the video footage that would have proved me innocent. So time has well passed by now for them to see somebody in the middle of the night measuring yeah, yes. my, friend, my friend who went and did it for me. Um, so I says, well, the, the, the markings aren't even one metre apart. They're 98 centimetres apart. So that means I must have been doing just over 25 miles an hour. Um, so that's count number two, falsifying documentation. I says, in the piece de resistance, um, I said, on this CD-ROM, and I went and slid it across to them because there's a thing in court called sliding it across or sliding it over. Oh, okay. Where if you've got a document, you put it on the table and you go and send it off down to them. And then they pick it up like playing a game of poker and decide whether they want to keep it or slide it back. So I slid it across to them. I says, on this CD run, which you've got a copy downstairs and the police station have got a copy posted to them. This contains phone calls where I called Naomi such and such at Loughborough Magistrates Court Police Telephone Call Handling Centre who has um, proved that they, pointing back to the police, they took on the responsibility of getting the Highways Agency's video footage and they've deliberately written to me after they knew it was already going to be erased when they could have told me at the time, the same day, and I would have called the Highways Agency and got that footage in time. They've deliberately allowed the most critical piece of evidence in this matter to be not only withheld from the defence, but destroyed permanently. And that would have put a stop to all of this. And they were all sitting there and the jaws were hitting the floor and gobsmacked. And then the magistrate women were all mumbling between each other. And then they didn't really have anywhere else to go. So the magistrates turned to the police prosecutors and said, um, 
would would the uh, police station uh, wish to proceed with prosecution? Yes, we'd like to proceed with prosecution. So I says, well, that's unbelievable, but fair enough. Let's have a court date then. <laughs> and I started putting my coat on because I knew that I was nearly finished and I weren't going to wait for them to dismiss me like a little schoolboy. So they gave the date for, um, I think it was the 24th or 23rd of uh, January 2015. And uh, I said, thank you very much then, goodbye. And I walked out and the usher woman who witnessed it all, when we got outside, she started laughing her head off. <laughs> Oh, Did she? Good. Yeah, well done. She's she never seen anything like it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was laughing as well. I says, not what don't people usually do? That's just, no, nobody ever does that. They all come in, oh, please, sir, please, and all that sort of thing. Um, so then I, I go home and I've got my court date and they're going to write to me in a couple of weeks confirming the court date and the next steps because it was going to go from that preliminary hearing to a proper trial. So I thought, right, OK, so it was coming up to like the middle um, end of November 2014. I thought, right, I'm going to have them. I'm going to make them bloody well work for this now if they want me. Mm. So I got back on the computer and I typed up a big letter. Dear Snow Hill Police Station, I require of you a complete audited catalogue of all phone calls, videos, photographs, documentation, um, minutes from meetings, court document and i just listed all these different things that i wanted them to start collating and, and send to me please respond within 28 days and nothing came of it at all and i thought do you know what they can't be bothered to get all that work done so then <laughs> on the 24th of december 2014 christmas eve is the best christmas present ever I get a letter in the post from the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, and I must admit it was on the crappiest quality over photocopied A4 paper where even the CPS letterhead was fading because they'd never bothered changing the toner ink. And it said, um, Dear Mr Dow, uh, West Midlands Police um, have decided not to pursue you in this matter regarding the speeding allegations on such and such a date and time because they don't have enough evidence against you, but also that you've got more evidence against them. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, oh, this is brilliant. And I did a little dance around the living room and I thought to myself, do you know, I should frame this, but I never got round to it. I should have uh. framed it and hung it on the wall. <laughs> and it was that one big thing at the end, that last big push of getting them to go and do all this paperwork all this stuff. again. That yeah. they just couldn't be bothered and they gave up in the end and that was it yeah and so we'd gone from them blaming me for speeding me knowing it was untrue to them completely dropping themselves in it with three separate counts of corruption and me getting all the hard evidence that they couldn't wriggle out of to them still wanting to proceed with um a prosecution thinking i was going to crumble to me then making them have to do a hell of a lot of homework and them not being bothered about it and giving up. <laughs> and, and had you ever been to court before? Have you ever done anything like this before? Um, well, before that, just being a sort of, you know, like they call them a Mackenzie friend who right. tells the person what they need to say next sort of thing. Yes. And, and that was mostly on, because I used to help people who went to the DWP for disability assessments because it was disgraceful at the DN DWP how they used to treat disabled people and they, they'd basically humiliate and belittle somebody before they'd agree to continue giving them their benefits. And people used to be too frightened to go. So I'd, I'd done that sort of thing. And then I'd been to a few, um, not magistrates court tribunals, they were sort of um, district court tribunals for those sorts of things. So I'd got a kind of sort of feel for it, you know. Yes. Um, but yes. other than that, it was the first time I'd ever been into a magistrate's court or been accused of something like that. Right. No, but I mean, going in with all that gumption, as you say, most people are sort of, perhaps it's their first offence. They don't know what to do. They yeah. don't know the procedure. And uh, they go in meek and mild because yeah. that's that's how our training has been, of course, you know, at yeah. school, go and see the headmaster. And it's like, oh, blimey, instead of um, being, as you were, full of gumption, and because you knew you were innocent and you had the yeah. evidence that they were far more corrupt. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and this is clearly going on all day, every day, up oh, and down yeah. the country. 
Yeah, I mean, there was people sitting in the waiting room that I was talking to. There was one guy who, he ran a small uh, logistics company with small box vans. And some one of his staff members had gone through a speed trap that had got the front of the vehicle. But they got their sun blind down so you couldn't see their face. And this guy was being accused of it because he was the boss and the book stops with him. And he went in and he was arguing the toss, um, saying that he, he didn't know who was driving it and he couldn't identify them. But when he came back out and I said to him, how did you get on? He said, oh, no, they're still going to prosecute me because the book stops with me and I have to blame whichever employee it is. And if I haven't got a record of which employee was driving the lorry at that time, then that yes. comes down under... Um, uh, what, Vosa is it or something? Vosa, um lorry drivers, logistics company, management, short right. runs, you know, that sort yeah. of thing. So we haven't really got a, a, a way to sort of wriggle out of it with these. But yeah, it is going on all the time, you know, that, and, and yeah. people have to stand up against it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mentioned before of a friend of mine who was caught on, the, I think, the M40 or one of them, um, and uh, he... He had a speeding fine. He he, the gantry changed pretty much as he went yeah. under it, and the camera flashed, and so they had their evidence. But it was as he went under it, so yeah. it was um, very unfair. But and and you know, being a good man, I suppose, or or just not wanting the hassle, didn't ch challenge it and paid it because we were all like, oh, the might of the police, the might yeah. of the courts. You know, what's the point? And uh, paid it like so many people do, but then they came back and they and they so they'd got the money and the so-called crime was over. Yeah. But then they had the audacity to say, "Oh, but you didn't give us your driving license number on the form." And he said, "Well, I did." And they said, "No, you didn't." And we're charging you something like seven hundred pounds or something. And you just well, think, I "Well, it's been paid. The, whatever the infringement was, it's gone." You, yeah. you, you know. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if they'd redacted that off of the document that he sent them, like they did with the things that I wrote on the document that they got rid of that I sent them. Right. I, I wouldn't put it past them at all, you know. It's, and it just seemed to be another way of g getting a little bit of bonus. Oh, well, you paid quite quickly, so yeah. maybe you'll pay again. Yeah. And uh, this is why we've got to stop acquiescing to all this nonsense. Plus the fact, where's the crime? Exactly. You know, the, where's the victim? In well, the thing, the thing I thought was, even if this ended up still going to that January 15 trial date, and even if they then still railroaded me down the guilty route, I would have appealed it and took it to a higher court. And it would have had to have crumbled then because a, a higher court judge would not be able to accept all that corruption and, and deception by the police that I'd got the hard evidence for. But mm. the thing was, was if I hadn't have thought it, it was either at the time going to be either three or six punts. I don't know which it was. I think it might have been six. Um, and it would have been whatever the fine was, plus the victim surcharge and court costs, which would have probably been a grand 1,500 quid's worth of money. And then on top of that, I would have had the next five years having expensive car insurance. Yes. And, and also, I might not have qualified for certain perks. Like I, when I have... The car insurance I have, I have any driver car insurance, so I can borrow somebody's car and drive it as a third party um, insurance policy. And maybe if you've got six points on your license for speeding, are they going to remove those sorts of perks and privileges from your policy? Which would have meant to me that if my car had broken down and we got two or three other cars in the household and I'd got, say, a wedding to get to to photograph, I, I would have been stuck. Yeah. And you know, let, so, let your client down. Yeah. But, I mean, the money side of things would have been the biggest thing because it would have ramped my insurance up. It would have been costs to the court as well and, you know, the fee, the fine, foe and, and the And all the time as well <laughs> and, and all the worry. I mean, these are other yeah. things that people don't take into consideration, that you're, yeah. you're engaged in worry about something which really is a completely insignificant thing, plus the fact you were innocent anyway. Yeah. Well, in the end, I put in for my expenses because they owed me. And because of all the to-in and fro-in I've done and the amount of time, I ended up making them pay me about 450-odd quid. I think it's £453.50 or something daft. And, um, yeah, so they ended up paying some towards my expenses, which I just thought was brilliant, you know. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, it didn't cover the time, really, because the thing I wasn't really going to say was, but... I may as well, was in 2014, I would have much rather have not had to deal with all this backwards and forwards to the court 
because in the June of 2014, unfortunately, my dad had been diagnosed with lung cancer oh. and I'd have rather have spent the time at home with him than having to muck about left, right and centre. Um, and he passed on the 21st of February 15, unfortunately. I mean, it's OK now. It's a long time ago and I'm OK. Yes, about it, but even know. so, I, I mean, yeah. but, but what that highlights is, of course, that people have lives which are full of ups and downs anyway. Yeah. And these extra things are just pointless things that are disturbing people's yeah. ordinary everyday lives. And there, you, yeah. as you say, you'd much rather been spending the last few uh, months or what have you with your father yes. and, um, I mean, than well, dealing look, with bloody bureaucracy. Yeah, I mean, lucky for me, being self-employed and working from home, I was able to take the time away to keep driving yes. to Birmingham and back but, and then have more time at home. So I did have extra time to sort of spend and whatnot. But sure. you're right, you know, if I'd have been an employee doing a Monday to Friday nine to five, Yes. And then I'd have had to have rushed off after work to get there before it closes or have they already closed? Do I have to go in my lunch break and risk being back at work? Late? Or take time off work. You know, that's the, yeah. another thing to try and get stuff done. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm aware of time on the on the podcast here. There was another thing that you wanted to um, talk about. Yes, it goes to a um, complete new subject then. This is the own nothing and be happy type of stuff. Yeah. Now. Quite a while ago, I looked at the fact that this, this this is how I've looked at it. We are four generations past World War II into home ownership and mortgages. And there's my grandparents, my parents, my generation, me, I'm 44, and then there's the younger ones below me. And as we know, banks don't lend money. They take the mortgage contracts that people sign and they bunch them up into portfolios called securitization. And that creates a triple A portfolio that the bank then flogs for anywhere between. I don't know what's going on with the fireworks. Oh, that was what, where did that come from? No idea. Um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so they take these portfolios full of, um, I must have done a, work, a hand gesture or something, and it meant securitization. <laughs> Um, I think that might, if he does this again, it would have been because of that. Um, All right, there so, you go. Yeah, so we know the banks flog the paperwork for somewhere between 10 to 25 times the amount people borrowed, and that's how they profit off people's mortgages, because they flog the contracts that are securitised against the bricks and mortar house. And while you're repaying the mortgage, you're basically just giving the money back that the bank never gave you in the first place because they generated it out of advanced credit. Yes. So because we know these things that, it means that a mortgage taker, a mortgagee, isn't making profit for the bank just because of the interest that they pay on their repayment. It's all about the paperwork being flogged for mega money mm. on the futures um, index, I think it is. Because by the time 30 years down the line has come and your mortgage is paid, your house is going to be worth a hell of a lot more with inflation and all the rest. So... If that pattern were to continue and everybody bought a house, paid for it, because when World War II ended, the, the nation was convinced to uh, build a nest egg, buy houses, have lots of kids, save up for a rainy day and put everything away so that when you die, the kids get it all as inheritance. And that was the general consensus of, of society moving up after World War II. Mm. So if that pattern happened, eventually there'd be no more houses left to sell to buy and nobody would end up wanting mortgages. So the banks want to get all the properties back and the establishment want to get all the properties back. So if you put that aside and think of that as the kind of catalyst for the next bit, which is they want to deliberately collapse the NHS because they want to push Britain onto the same sort of medical insurance scenarios as America have. And if you've looked at the costs of a broken leg or of something simple in America, you're looking at tens of thousands of pounds for a simple hospital stay and some treatment. It's massively overinflated, extorted costs. So if Britain moved away from having an NHS into medical insurance, you'd either have a, an individual insurance policy or you'd have a family insurance insurance policy for the mum and dad and the kids. Yeah, That policy would have a certain amount of money in it to fund medical treatment for anyone in the family. Somebody gets ill, tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of that money gets evaporated paying the, the bills for that. And then eventually somewhere down the line, 
the insurance policy becomes empty because little Timmy got sick and it's all been used up. But then if somebody else gets sick and there's no money left in that policy to pay for it, the insurance companies would say, don't worry, Mr. Smith, but what we'll do is we'll continue to fund all the medical treatment on the basis that you allow us to put a commercial lien against oh, your yeah, wealth yeah. estate. Yes. So the house and the assets, whoever it is that owns the house and has the policy, mum or dad say, they then have a massive lien put against their wealth estate, which is your house, your assets and your savings and whatnot. When they die, the wealth estate the house etc goes into probate and then along comes the insurance company to snatch the lot before the kids yes. get to inherit so the short of that is is that the kids don't inherit a house there's nothing left for them to have um, and that means that they're not getting a free house that mum and dad paid for over the last 30 40 years and thus they've either got to buy one of their own accord or go into renting and or, or get a mortgage and then That's you've got very interesting yeah, and the banks have got the mortgage paperwork back. And of course, we've seen we've seen that sort of policy being enacted by the fact that people are getting dementia, which is something that oh, never really happened before. Just literally, just about to mention this. Right. I've spoken to lots of people. One of them was a lady working at the bar at a wedding venue in Stratford, and I was talking about this to her about I don't know nine or ten years ago now, and she said this is exactly what happens because her mum had got. Alzheimer's and she'd ended up going into a care home and because her mum owned a house she had to pay for the care she, home yeah but what they did was the house stood there dormant because the, the old lady had no cash and they couldn't sell the house because it needed doing up and it wasn't practical to force somebody to sell up at that point so it turns out that they whack a lien on it to pay for the uh, um, care home costs for how many years she's in there um, withering away and dying and then when it gets to the old lady dying along comes the care homes companies to snatch everything away at probate again so that's what's been going on with a lot of people there now if somebody has alzheimer's or dementia or they have to go into a care home for any other reason and they're poor they usually get local council sponsorship and it's them that pay for everything mm. So, I mean, on saying that, the best thing people can really do is really do look at private trusts where yeah. you can put all your house, your assets, your cars, your savings, your jewellery, everything that's yours into a trust and the whole family are basically beneficiaries. So when you die, nothing changes and the kids get everything because they're still a beneficiary of the same trust. Because do you remember when the Duke of Westminster died and there was, what was it, £9 billion? Pounds? Yes, I can't Duke, remember exactly. Yeah, the Duke of Westminster died. Nine billion quid was in his wealth estate. Three billion of that was supposed to go straight into the public purse in the inheritance tax. But because the whole lot was in a trust, his son ended up getting everything because nothing changed. They couldn't you see, that's, that's the thing. This is what they do. You yeah. know, the rich, the elite, the, the you know, and they they know all this. They've been taught this at school. They, yeah. they uh, go in circles where this is normal stuff. They don't Tony watch Blair. mainstream. Yeah. Yeah, Tony Blair famously said, own nothing, control everything. So if anybody ever tried to sue Tony Blair, everything he owns is inside trusts. So yeah. nobody can get anything. Yeah. You know? So yeah. I think really that if it's good for the goose, it should be good for the gander. You know, so we should all start looking at setting up trusts, even if it's... I know people say we need a private common law trust that has nothing to do with even a solicitor. But to be more, to be safer, you can go to a solicitor and get them to set up a private family trust, even though it still falls under civil um, acts and statute legislation. But it still does mean that nothing goes through any in inheritance or probate stages when somebody dies. Yeah. And I think everybody should start looking at that. And maybe we might end up with a team of renegade solicitors that do it a hell of a lot cheaper so that people who can't afford, I don't know, three and a half grand or whatever it is, and then the annual upkeep costs. You know, if they make that sort of thing cost available to everybody, then mm. none of these establishment lot will ever be able to get their grubby mitts on anybody's houses. And then the That's... kids always get what they're guaranteed from mum and dad. Yes. What a fascinating uh, point to, yeah. uh, to to bring to our attention. Um 
That is that is really interesting because I went through that with my dad, and when he he went into a home, and and of course in the end we were spending thousands every week just to keep him going. Well, and but, it's but, the and it's a horrible it's a horrible thing because you know yeah. it's a one way story well, with the last him. Thing, yeah, and 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 ultimately you're going. Well, I hope he dies early because the, oh, you can see know. the money driven, and and it's awful to think like yeah. that. But and that's, that's what causes rifts in families as well. You know? Exactly, yeah. But, I mean, the last thing I was going to say was when, when my dad died, he'd been a coal miner since he was a teenager and he'd done all the overtime. He'd paid into a really good pension. In 1994, I think it was, they privatised the coal board and all the coal miners got scammed and conned into reinvesting their pension pots into some scheme or other. And then when my dad died, my mum got peanuts, basically. I think she got 20 grand from Scottish Widow. And it should have actually been several hundreds of thousands of pounds. Uh. So we, we, my mum took it on when my dad died, and she's ended up having it with the ombudsman. And then my mum sadly passed away in um, the 1st of June 2020 because the George Elliott Hospital cancelled her operation in April 2020 because of the pandemic. Right, because, yeah. And then she went downhill because of that. So I've now got the ombudsman. I've, I've just had to get a grant of probate from a solicitor that's cost me a few bob so that I can take it on. And hopefully they'll sort it out because that was supposed to be mine and my brother's inheritance. So all the coal miners got robbed of their pensions as well. And it, just never, it never stops. It never no. stops. No. And, and, and this kind of stuff is coming out more and more and more. I mean, we are in the great revelation yeah. period now where where it is all coming out. But you're absolutely right. We do need to protect ourselves so that they they cannot get their mitts on the great um, the great taking yeah, as, the, yeah. as that book has just come out. Um, th- thank you so much, John, for coming on the show and telling Thanks us all for about having it. Me. That hour went really quickly. I mean, is that uh, hour like two yeah. o'clock? I know, I know. So there Brilliant. we go. Um, and I'm sure it's the same, but what a what a draw drop, uh, various jaw dropping moments within that, um, <laughs> which was absolutely stunning. Um, so there you go. I mean, it's it's uh, it just goes to show the corruption that is in there. But well done you for having oh, the uh, the bravery to go into that room and just take it over. Last think- tip: anybody goes to court for things like speeding fines, go in there as chipper as possible and run run the show and just let their jaws hit the floor. But look back through this interview uh, video and sort of look at the steps I took. Wolverhampton yeah. Magistrates Court dealing with Birmingham Court, the paperwork. Loughborough Magistrates Court dealing with all of England's phone calls for police stations. So if that helps people, then take the same research routes and, and get yourself out of the same bother. I'm sure you've given people plenty of ideas and ammunition <laughs> to go forward, which is what we need. So thank yeah. you again. It's been well, lovely, uh, lovely to uh, to, to uh, have a conversation with you, John. Likewise. Thanks for having me on and uh, look forward to many more shows to watch. Well, thank you very much. And yeah, if you uh, get uh, embroiled in anything else, you've got another point, do come back on the show. Oh, definitely. Um, and, and, and let us know. Um, in do. the meantime, good luck with all the photography and the video work. I know how time consuming that can be. Uh, all those yeah. hours in front of screens. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thanks ever so much then. I'll, sh- I'll let you get off because you've probably got loads of other people to talk to as well. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, John. Wonderful, Wonderful. stuff. Take care. Well, take care. Well, there we are, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I will be back with more monologues and, of course, more wonderful guests. But in the meantime, from John and myself, until next time, goodbye.